will some of the players who maybe didn't have many speaking lines have a few in this season? Maybe. Okay. And is it possible that Rebecca and Coach Lasso have a little thing? Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks for clicking on this YouTube video, my interviews with the cast of Ted Lasso. I think at this point I've talked to everybody except the key grips. Uh, these interviews taking place over the past few weeks. So for example, in the Brett and Phil interview, I was actually on a road trip with my husband. In my Brendan Nick interview, it was the day after the Golden Globes and Jason's hoodie was getting a lot of buzz. Turns out I have a onesie that looked a little bit like his hoodie, so I plopped that on. And then finally, the day after International Women's Day, I had the pleasure of Zooming with Hannah and her good friend, Juno Temple. I'll be honest, I have not been this invested in a sports team since the Arizona Cardinals lost to the Steelers in the 2009 Super Bowl, a loss I am still not over, even though it's another reason why I need to pay attention to Ted Lasso and some of his messages like be a goldfish. Maybe I would have moved on by now. Quick shout out to my girlfriend out of Seattle. She's in television, Kim Holcomb. She's the reason I love this show. She's the one who recommended it to me initially. And even though she's been posting a lot of London pictures lately, like throwbacks, she knows how much we both love London and we miss traveling there right now. Actually, it's kind of mean what she's doing. Uh, this is for you, Kim. These interviews are dedicated to you. I repaid you with Money Heist, but you got me hooked on Ted Lasso, so thank you for that. No spoilers, I floated a fan theory by Nick and Brendan, that's about it, because honestly, I don't wanna know what happens. I wanna see it for myself and enjoy it unfold when it does this summer sometime. So I hope you guys enjoy my interviews. I just have to explain to you guys how much I love this show. I am actually in a very small town in Mexico. I'm on a road trip. This is Loreto, Mexico. <laughs> oh, this is this is definitely the classiest. This is winning so far. Well, the yeah, my husband is sleeping, so I'm in a corner basically, and I've poached some furniture. There are so many things to talk about, and I know you guys are currently shooting, right? So how far along are you right now? Because I I'm so excited. Uh, I, we're not allowed. To, I mean, we we're on episode. We're, we're four episodes in. Uh, I think four or five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when, yeah. We, when we when we ended, first of all, it's one of the greatest endings I've ever seen, where basically Hannah gets a bunch of water just thrown in her face via Jason Sudeikis's mouth. <laughs> I, I laughed out loud. So tell me, she's dried off at least in season two. Is she at least dry I by episode four? Spoil, we can't spoil anything. I'm afraid she might still have a wet face. I can't. Yeah. I just can't say. Yeah. All I'll say is they've employed someone to follow her around with a towel. But, you know, again, I don't want to, no, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> how, how far in did you guys know, and, and Phil, I'll start with you on this. How far in did you guys know um, before they announced you were renewed for not just one season, but two, which doesn't happen often? Um, mm. How much sooner did you know that you guys had been renewed? I think I spoke to Brett. I think I found out through, because, you know, um, I call Brett most days um and uh and we have a chat but i think that that was you know i i think really that was sort of i mean i i i found out at the same time i think that um probably most others found out but brett you i think you may have known a little bit before i think you were writing on series two before yeah we, we we'd always had the plan for the three seasons uh so we okay. were writing I, I think we were writing in the hope it would happen, and then it happened. So, and I don't think it was much before it was announced that we had to. I think it was maybe a day before. Well, there are, there are so many lessons that I learned from the. I, I mean, I cried, I laughed. There were so many emotions you feel throughout every single episode, and there are so many mottos. Whether it's be a goldfish that stick with you, um, Brett, I'll start with you. Is there one throughout the all those great lines, all those great lessons? What is the one that will stay with you forever? That maybe you learned on Ted Lasso. Do you know what? Truthfully, I found myself saying a lot to people at the end of something, and I do mean it, and I've learned it from Telesso. I do now say a lot. I appreciate you. That is what I have taken from Telesso. I say that a lot now. How about you, Phil? What's the one that you cut that, that will stay with you that you learned? Can, how, can I go, can I go blue? Can I say a word that's that's included in the script? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think when um, Nate is speaking to someone in a motivational manner. Oh, and he yes. asked them if if they've if they've got a Brazilian. And he goes, "What do you say?" And he goes, "Did a stutter, dickhead." The way that Nick delivers that line, 
is like it's it's up there with like Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> it's up there. <laughs> it's like a it's a classic. It's an absolute classic delivery. Uh, yeah. Well, and yeah. and what's so great about that scene and so many, and that's one of the biggest lessons for me, is that everybody has a voice and everybody deserves a chance to be supported and allowed to express their voice. And and there are so many times that Jason, Ted, Ted Lasso, allows people to be heard. And I just love that whole concept of, you know what, everybody matters, everybody's opinion is important. And that scene mm. in particular is so great. Um, unlikely lessons or an unlikely source of a lesson, because again, Ted comes in, you guys are both very skeptical about this guy from America coming in. Um, Brett, a, a lesson you learned from an unlikely source. In, in, in real life? Yeah, in real life. Uh, 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 yeah. Oh. I, okay, I used to work in a nightclub, and the guy who was the bouncer, and he looked like he looked so he looked like He Man if He Man was a skinhead <laughs> and carried weapons. Like he was a very <laughs> scary looking guy, and he had the soul of a poet. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to stand and talk to him uh, every night, and he he taught me more about the world and beauty and love. Uh, his oh, view wow. his view on relationships was like incredible and i think about him a lot and i go that man that no one talked to and just looked fucking i don't know if i'm allowed to swear <laughs> yep you're you good know, like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he 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 i learned a lot from that guy did you channel him at all for roy kent's gruffness and hardness yeah i hate to just steal essentially what brett's just said but uh the same bouncer at the nightclub? Yeah, <laughs> man, it was me. Yeah, it was me. It was me. Um, no, I mean, like, I think that, you know, in a, in a long, conflated story, uh, my friends and I were um, having, like, a, a really emotional... You know those moments when you're looking at the sunset and you're like, oh, my God, I think that we're connected to the world in such a profound way, when really you're just, you know... And we, we were, you know, we were sober. Uh, and it was, you know, it felt like a really special moment. And then this guy turned up, he was called Keith, and he um, had uh, no hair and he turned up on a Harley. And we were a bit like, oh, that's a shame. Our really profound moment has been ruined. And he just came up and he was, he was, it was in Bristol and he, you know, Bristol's quite, it's a very um, beautiful rural accent. Um, but, you know, you know, I think to some, it might seem, sound a bit sort of simple. And um, he just was the most like gorgeously uh, open and sweet man. And I think that he just totally, it was one of those things that were like, you know, it was a nice sunset before, but then this guy came along and told us his sort of life story. And I think we That's had immediately awesome. judged him to be boring. And then, you know, we were curious as you know, Ted talks about in the first yeah. series and we found out about this man and it suddenly made this evening into this like amazing thing that my friends and I still remember. Yeah, another great Ted Lasso. Don't judge a book by its cover. I know they wrapped me, but quickly, there are so many funny, you know, T and I on a big hiatus, the whole biscuits thing, you know, all the things that go along with uh, being American versus being British. What's the strangest, most bizarre American thing that you guys are just not into? Or Ted, it's tea. How about you guys? The, 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 the way that you guys say schedule, I think it's probably <laughs> the, the hardest thing for me. Okay. Uh, for me, it's it's pe people saying, how are you doing when you walk in the shop? I'm always like, we don't do that in England. It's quite threatening. <laughs> well, I'm going to end by saying I appreciate you. I'm going to steal something. You you and I cannot wait. I swear I wish there was a set visit. I even told Ernie from Apple TV. I'm like, if you guys do any set visit on this, please, I will quarantine. I'll get vaccinated. I'll do whatever it takes. I just can't wait for season two and three. Thanks, Thanks. you guys. Thanks, Tara. That's really lovely. Thanks to me. Hey, Tara. Sarah, nice hoodie. Well, you know what? What are the odds I happen to have a onesie that looked suspiciously like Jason's hoodie the other night? I thought I have to pull this out for this show. <laughs> so thank you for noticing. I am, I am such a fan. Honestly, if the UK was open, I would have been stalking you guys on the set right now, just kind of hiding behind a bush. But thank you for your time today. I have to start with you, Brendan. Congratulations. You're a new dad. Coach Beard now has a son. So my question is, out of all the lessons, that Ted Lasso imparts to his teammates and to the viewers, what's the one you can't wait to teach your little boy? Um, got so many good ones. I think, you know, be curious, not judgmental is the one that's uh, the most valuable, uh, the one that'll get you through the longest and the one that'll, you know, get you uh, interacting with people in a, in a healthy yeah. way.
Nick, I know I, I've heard that your father, did he work for FIFA at one point? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did indeed. Yeah. So I know he's a big soccer or football fan. So what did he think when he got through the season, season one, he must have loved this. What did he think of it? He, he did actually both my mum and dad re really enjoyed it and you know my mum is less less of a, a football less of a sports fan in general and uh so yeah but they both loved it and yeah my, i think uh not, not that i was ever really a, a disappointment to my dad but i think he would have liked it if i preferred football a lot when i was younger uh, which i i sort of proactively didn't and you know i was taken to a lot of football games because he used to get a lot of tickets and, and stuff and uh you know, I'd sit. I, I genuinely once sat at a Leeds United um, game at Elland Road, and I was probably about eight. And almost as an act of defiance, I took my knitting with me. Like I used to knit <laughs> as a kid, and uh, genuinely, I, I did. And uh, so I, I feel like I've sort of, <laughs> Brendan. <laughs> well, and, uh, yeah, I feel like I've made it up to my dad now. He 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 like he he really digs the show. So yeah. I have to ask about uh, one of, I mean, there are so many favorite scenes that I have, but obviously, Nick, one of the great ones is when you are forced into the locker room to kind of speak your mind to the players and get them motivated, and you are just a fish out of water and nervous. So in light of that, uh, Brendan, you first, what is that, I, I guess, that uh, experience in your career where you were really just left out hanging and you had to either pull it together or fall apart? Um. Well, I guess sort of pre-career, I was uh, in my senior year of college, I was playing the lead in a Moliere play called The Imaginary Invalid. And about 10 minutes into the show, I throw an orange off stage at my, uh, at my, at my wife, and then she's supposed to come on and we, you know, we do French uh, comedy about it. But uh, I threw the orange off stage and she wasn't actually there. But anyway, I'm like, oh, sure, she was just not there. She's coming around. She does not come on stage. And... Uh, there are differing reports as to how long I then improvised Moliere. Some say it was five minutes. Some say it was 10. It felt like three straight days uh, <laughs> before she finally got in. But we got through it. I don't know how it's helping me now, but hey, yeah, yeah, he improvised uh, in French Moliere. Ugh. Well, again, it came in handy. You're brilliant at it. Nick, how about you? Uh, that moment where you kind of experienced what your character did in the, in the uh, show. Well, well weird, weirdly, not not sort of dissimilar. I, and, and I... Forgive me if this sounds like a, a sort of a name drop in any way, but I, one of the first films that I did was um, The Martian, the Ridley Scott film, and right. um, and when I got it, I you know I was completely you know I was still relatively new, certainly new to doing any anything like on that on that scale, and you know I was so excited but obviously really scared, and I I was playing this uh, a Californian scientist, um, and uh, you know I had learned the words, I'd learned it all phonetically because I was doing a U.S. accent, and I was like, okay, I've got to really focus on it, and um. I remember getting to the set and um, they were literally about to call action and Ridley Scott kind of came over and uh, and it was quite technical, a lot of the dialogue. And he just said, oh, um, but don't do these, uh, just just improvise, just improvise. And because I hadn't learned the words phonetically, I didn't have to improvise in an American accent. So I was oh. just terrified. And uh, I don't know how I managed to cobble something together. I remember texting a vocal coach that I had worked with just asking him how to say words like telemetry and things like that, because I have no idea. Uh, what Can I tell do. you, that's almost cruel. Ridley Scott's just mean. Like, to me, that's just mean. <laughs> I think he thought it was going to free me up, but I just uh, <laughs> slammed up. <laughs> I know they're about to wrap me. I know you can't say much about season two, so I'm going to give you my prediction and then just at least answer, will some of the players who maybe didn't have many speaking lines have a few in this season? Like maybe some, besides Danny and Sam and some of the ones we've come to love. Maybe. Okay. And is it possible that Rebecca and Coach Lasso have a little thing? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Howdy, partner. Tara, I don't. I I genuinely haven't seen script. We, we're about halfway through filming, and I've not seen script seven to twelve. But I said the other day, I wonder if I as in just out of nothing. I, I said the same thing. I said. Oh, you know, Rebecca and Coach Lasso make a great couple, well, but who knows? Okay. I genuinely don't know. Okay, well, you and I are on the same page, at least. Congratulations. I cannot wait for season two. And honestly, I may see you then when you're shooting season three. Just look for the blonde and the onesie in the bush. I'm not kidding you. I love this show so much. <laughs> Congrats, you guys. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. First of all, I cannot congratulate you both enough. Hannah, I expect the same kind of enthusiasm during this interview <laughs> that I got during the acceptance speech. I hope uh, I live up to it. <laughs> Can you see, Tara, can you just see that Juno just lost her SHI? I just, she she just saw your top. 
Oh, I get, I've got the be a goldfish top. What? <laughs> Did you hear? She's like, let me, let me, let me go, fish. <laughs> Speaking of outfits, they just sent a picture. It was so cute, you know, to see you cradled in Hannah's arms. I love this picture, not only because it shows genuine love and support, but I almost feel like you were trying to rob her and escape detection at night, but then stumbled upon an acceptance speech and ended up on the couch. <laughs> well, I think it was also a moment of like, am I allowed to be leaping on her? Or am I going like to stop shooting? It's on to me like a little badge. <laughs> oh, it was so cute. And the last question I'll ask about uh, the other night. You gave a shout out, Hannah, to Sausage Face. I assumed at the time it was your daughter, but then I saw the picture of Juno. Were you referring to your daughter or Juno? No, that's, that's my little girl who I don't I don't ever tell anyone her name because I just want to keep her private. And that, that's her. But, you know, when she's older, she can decide if, if she wants to be out there. But I do call her Sausage Face in real life. They will they'll tell you. And uh, yeah, do you know what, Tara, to be perfectly honest, I was saying to Juno straight after it, if somebody told me that for 30 seconds I just went, ah, I would have actually believed you, but it, I had to watch it back and I thought, I have no recollection of that at all. Oh, it None. was such a great moment. It was such a great moment. There are so many great moments in this series. Juno, I think you honestly pulled off one of the hardest parts of the series, which was to convince us that you could be into one guy and then end up with somebody else by the end of the season. How did you pull that off? Because if we don't buy that, you mm -hmm. kind of lost me. Mm -hmm. um, how did I pull that off? With really good writing and really good co-stars. <laughs> and being fabulous, Tara. Is <laughs> but I mean, I think it's about, it's about, you know, the truly what I, I think we're so lucky on this show as women that have been given really, really solid female roles, you know, and solid female roles that really connect with each other. And, you know, I think both my co-stars that I had have moments of being in love with and I, I love off camera so much, Phil and Brett, it's like, I think the joy with Keely is that she, she still loves them. She still loves Jamie when it falls apart, but she loves him from the angle where it's not a romance anymore on from the angle of like, I'm going to, I want, I want to help be, I want to be a real friend to him. I want to be somebody that's real and honest and genuine in his life. And I think she really feels that with all of her relationships, you know? And I remember thinking at that moment in the, in season one, where she, the, it's at the gala and we've been doing the paddle betting and yep. Roy, looks at her and says, please don't use me to get back to your boyfriend. And that moment really, as, an, as a human, his delivery of that performance in that moment was like, oh, wow. And I fell in love with him in that moment. Yeah. And I was like, wow, yeah, no. Well, your performance in that moment, because again, that was one of those, just the, your face switch when you, it dawns on you, because you're also talking to Jamie Tart at the time. I thought that was one of the greatest moments as well, um, obviously for the same reason, but for a few, other reasons. You know, I, Hannah, I can't rave enough about your character. And what was funny is to me, the end scene of season one, which is a comedic gut punch, and I still can laugh about it. <laughs> it's one of the greatest endings. But here's the funny part about your co stars. So Phil and Brett were very cagey. They wouldn't even tell me if you had dried off by, by episode one of season two. And then I talked to Brendan and Nick, who are a little more forthcoming. But I guess my question to you is, is there anything, whether it takes place or not, that by the end of season one, you were kind of hoping to explore in season two? Honestly, I don't want to know what happens, but in your opinion, what was something that maybe you were kind of hoping to explore? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. We won't know until No, it no. Do you know what? I don't even, I've never even genuinely let that question into my head. I just feel like they are rolling through their lives together and none of them realize that they all need each other. And their linchpin is Ted Lasso. And that'll do for me and it seems to be working you know people ask me when we get when we get to that final scene you know does Rebecca really think actually do you know what? I really can be a, a, a brilliant football club owner I'm passionate about these people and I want blah, 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 x y and z or you know she's attracted to this person not attracted to that, that but it has never crossed my mind hmm. and it and it's even where how we're meandering through season two at the moment I feel like she goes into like a little room and she's like having a feel around in here and she's over here. And that's the beauty of having such crazy good writing that I feel like as long as we're regurgitating the brilliance from the writer's room, 
with kind of just the vessels because they've got it all covered. The amount of things they planted in season one yeah. that I'm picking up in season two. And I'm like, Jason, when you said to do this with that person and this and with that person, he's like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you are a weird, creepy wizard. <laughs> a real creepy wizard. I like that. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I've told people it is it is so true. You have to watch this season more than once just to pick up yeah, on yeah, the clips, the lines, yeah. the nuances, everything. Um, I asked the other cast. I know they're about to wrap me. There are so many great lessons in this, lessons that maybe you already knew, maybe that were just complete perspective shifts. So, Juno, I'll start with you. What's the lesson you learned from season one that actually you've now adopted in your life? Um, uh, can I answer that for her for a second while she gets her chisels yeah. together? <laughs> <laughs> she, this person here, is my female version of Ted Lasso in real life. <laughs> that is what she brings to the room and what she brings to your, what she's brought to my life mm-hmm. as Hannah. That thing of just accepting everybody that is around her, always seeing the good and not in a cheesy, saccharine way. And so that's why she's faltering to answer because she is the the the, the potion. Yeah, I <laughs> I don't know. What to say <laughs> um, I mean, I guess lesson that I learned from season one is yeah, I don't want to ever think about life before Hannah Waddingham. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I know they wrapped me. I just I can't thank you enough. On on the day after International Women's Day, it is a true treat to talk to you two women because you represent in person and on screen um, the kind of friends I hope to continue having in my life. I hope to do this in person next time. I'm dying that we can't be there for some sort of set right. visit. Can I just so. say from from my heart to yours, I cannot tell you what what my win means to me. Ah. You could tell. Thank you. Congratulations. So deserved. I can't it's wait for the next It's such a treat season. to be able to, to speak to you all and say thank you. It's yeah. crazy. It's lovely. Yeah. Trust me. We appreciate your time. I know it's much later there than it is here. So thanks so much. And thanks to Apple and everybody watching that's like, get rid of her. So thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.